thank everyone for coming out today. Welcome to our, the Ars Reed Institute's latest event, Postal Finances and Postal Reform. My name is Nick Zayas. I'm a fellow in commercial freedom at the Ars Reed Institute, where my research fo focuses on postal issues. Um, I'll, be the, I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, the Postal Service's finances, financial struggles are really well documented. We, the administration has its plans, Congress has its plans, and it's sometimes hard to figure out what the path forward for USPS is. Uh, that's why we brought together this, this distinguished panel to address a, a variety of issues related to the USPS's financial sta state. Uh, each panel will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll move to Q&A. And so, so let's meet our panel. I'm, we're gonna start out with Kevin Kozar, Vice President for Policy at the R Street Institute. He's probably written more than almost anyone else in Washington on postal issues from his time at the Congressional Research Service. Uh, and outside of that, his research focuses on Congress and he's partially responsible for getting access to CRS reports that I hope you all are excited over. Um, and next up will be Dr. Robert Shapiro, who is chairman of Sonicon um, from 1997 to 2001. He was undersecretary of uh, of Commerce for Economic Affairs. He's, a, he's advised numerous campaigns and politicians from Bill Clinton to uh, and Al Gore to Barack Obama uh, and, and, has recent, and has written extensively on the financial condition of the Postal Service. Uh, finally will be Jan James Campbell, who is an attorney, consultant, and author who, who's been working on postal issues since the 1980s. He's, he's a, he, he is a member of the State Department's Advisory Committee on International Postal and Delivery Services and has been writing on postal issues for more than three decades. Um, Mr. Campbell is an expert on the UN's Universal Postal Union, and I'm sure he would love to take questions in the Q&A on that. Um, so without any further ado, let's get started with Kevin. All right, thank you, Nick, uh, and thank you all for attending. Uh, let me first say that I want to invite you after this event to feel free to contact me with any questions you have about postal issues. I worked them for more than a decade at CRS and it's a habit I can't quit. So if there's something you want to know, no matter how obscure, feel free to ask me. And if I don't know the answer, uh, I'm happy to point you to many, one of the many postal smarties who I know, many of whom are in this room. I should also note that on Twitter, I posted some graphs on USPS finances uh, that you can look at. My handle is at Kevin R. Kosar. I figured people often look at their phones during these sorts of events, so hey, might as well make it easy and put my <laughs> graphs out there, and that way you don't have to feel guilty about doing this. Now, uh, for this panel, my charge is to speak about the financial condition of the Postal Service. As many of you know, the Postal Service is a self-funding entity. Uh, I've often characterized it as a government corporation. It's relatively rare bird. We only have about two dozen government corporations, you know, entities which mostly do not get uh, appropriations and instead provide services or products uh, and collect fees in order to try to cover their costs. Uh, Postal Service, so to be clear, it goes through the appropriations process, but it does not get by financially thanks to appropriations. Uh, Postal Service, as many of you know, operates on a fiscal year just like the rest of the government, starting on October 1 and concluding on September 30. It publicly reports each quarter the, um, on a form called the 10-Q, and then it issues an annual report about its finances called the 10-K. And that latter comes out in mm, November, mid-November, late November. These are really useful documents, and I, on my Twitter feed, put a link to the Postal Service's website, which has a page dedicated to Postal Service financial reports. It's a great document. It's the place you go where you want basic data on what the Postal Service is doing, what its revenues are, how many mail pieces are out. It's, it's, it's moving and all that sort of stuff. Now, let's move to my take, which in short is that the Post Office's finances are, <clears throat> are not good. In quarter three, which ended on June 30, USPS lost 1.4 billion. Last year, the Postal Service had a shortfall of 2.6 billion. How much uh, the Postal Service will lose this year, uh, it's not clear, but we'll find out mid-November with the 10K. I should, before I go any further, say that there, there is a bit of good news. 
about the Postal Service fines is it's not all doom and gloom, which is that the Postal Service is not presently in danger of shutting down due to a cash crunch. Presently, the agency actually has uh, a bit more than $11 billion in cash sitting its, uh, in its account in the Treasury. So we're not in the scary place where we were back in 2005 and the Postal Service barely had enough money to keep operating. That was a really bad time, not least because there was no plan B for what to do in the event that the USPS did not have enough cash to open its doors. There's nothing in Title 39 which lays out postal law that provides an obvious path forward should the Postal Service face a liquidity crisis. You know, heaven forbid we find ourselves there again, but it's entirely possible, and one would hope that we would take steps to prepare. So $11 billion in the bank, that sounds like good news, but the good news comes with a big bad asterisk. A reason the USPS has so much cash on hand is that it's not putting uh, sufficient cash towards reducing its debts, which are considerable. Postal Service owes $15 billion to the Treasury in a kind of credit line, and it has another more than $100 billion in unfunded pension and retiree health care obligations. Uh, once again, on the Twitter feed, I've got a link to the GAO report where you can see where these numbers are, are broken out. Unless Postal Service starts paying down these obligations, they're going to grow. That's the way it works. We have seen this movie before, whether it's large private companies that underfund pension and health care benefits, whether it's states and municipalities that you know, don't put enough aside. You hit these points of crisis where, oh my goodness, the debt is so enormous and there is just no way that you can cover it. And that's scary. It's scary because these are promises made to postal workers. These are commitments the agency has made to them. And if they can't make good on those, what happens? Do they get stiffed? Or do taxpayers have to come in and bail the situation out? It'd be really nice if we could not find ourselves in that situation in the future. So how did we get here? The answer, as far as I can tell, is pretty straightforward. Falling mail volume. In the past decade, mail volume has declined 30%. Today, despite postage price increases and a huge rise in the number of packages the Postal Service is carrying, the agency's revenues are the same as they were in 2005, about $70 billion per year. And that's $70 billion with a B. That makes it hard to cover operating costs to say nothing of turning a profit and paying down unfunded obligations. The decline in mail volume is not hard to understand. Big companies are sending less paper mail and using other means to communicate with customers. I should add here that uh, it's a popular misconception that the Postal Service, you know, its bread and butter is, you know, when you and I go there and drop off a postcard and buy some stamps or, you know, re return a package or something like that. Most of what goes through the mail is not sent by you or I. It may be received by you or I, but it's not sent by you or I. It is sent by private businesses, government, not-for-profits, uh, maybe 5%. I mean, it's hard when you get into the weeds to figure out exactly how much mail is sent by you or I, but 5%, I think, is a pretty safe figure. Maybe somebody would argue it's 7, somebody may argue it's 3. But that's a very small portion of the Postal Service's volume. Its money comes by operating in a business-to-business -business fashion. Truckloads of magazines pulling up to postal depots and that sort of thing. Now, the Postal Service's current plight, as I see it, is a bit like the plight of DC Metro. Government built this very big system for moving things with great public purposes in mind. But we've experienced a technological revolution that has spawned other options for customers. 15 years ago when I got to DC, the choices for transportation were metro, cab, or drive in one's own personal car. Now we have scooters, we have bike shares, we have dedicated bike lanes, we have TNCs like Uber and Lyft. There are more options. Unsurprisingly, people will use those options, and when they use those options, demand for Metro has dropped. Same situation is happening with the Postal Service. I used to get all my bills via first-class mail and pay them via first-class mail. Um, now I get nearly all of them all online, and I pay them that same way. The days of having to go through stamps and getting these first-class correspondence 
those are just passing. Uh, magazines, another example, which once made up a big portion of the mail stream, are growing fewer as more consumers get their ne news and indulge their cat fancies and the like online. Yet we still have this huge entity, this giant network that spans the whole continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Virgin Islands, etc., and also has to work with foreign nations, a topic uh, that Jim knows very well. We have this immense network, um, but the revenues are not coming in at the levels that they used to. <coughs> Postal Service still has to deliver, despite the drop in volume, six days a week, and it still operates under mandates that require it to employ high cost labor. And the Postal Service still has limited pricing discretion with a, some of its products and services. Very difficult operating environment, especially, again, when aggregate demand for your service is going down. Now, before I kind of wrap up my comments, I, I feel like I should say something about the Retiree Health Benefits Fund. Um, I've been talking about it, I think, for dozen years now, um, but it's a really complicated thing and subject to widespread misunderstanding. There are a lot of folks who say that the Postal Service, its financial condition, it's the fault of those idiots in Congress and the Retiree Health Benefits Plan. If it wasn't for those legislators, we wouldn't be in this situation. What they point to specifically is that in 2006, as part of the Postal uh, Accountability Enhancement Act, uh, there was an extensive set of provisions that required the Postal Service to begin to pre-fund the health care benefits that they were promising to current employees, which were to be delivered when they were retirees. So in basically taking retiree health obligations and treating them like pensions, pre-fund them, don't just try to pay them out of pocket each year. And there was a lot of reasoning for why this was thought to be a good idea. The Postal Service's future you know, might involve a contraction in business. There might be a demographic bubble analogous to what we were dealing with with Social Security, where you had a whole bunch of boomers all of a sudden drawing on the system and not enough flowing in. It is true, as the critics point out, that when Congress wrote the law, it mandated an overly aggressive payment scheme. It was asking the Postal Service each year to put out five to seven billion dollars pull it out of your pocket and throw it into there, and you couldn't touch it for 10 years to pay retiree health benefits. That was too aggressive in and of itself. We also had the fact that after that law was enacted, we hit a recession and mail volume started to drop, so revenues took a hit. So that was like an unexpected whammy to add to the initial whammy. But the Retiree Health Benefits Fund, although it sucked a lot of cash out of the Postal Service's pockets in the first few years, it's not to blame for this situation. In fact, the Postal Service quit paying in to the Retiree Health Benefits Fund in 2010. That's the last year that they paid in per the mandated schedule. After that, they just quit sending the money in because they said they didn't have the cash. And again, you know, we're in a picture where revenues are going down and per capita employment costs rise, which is kind of normal for a business you're going to have financial troubles. So to wrap this up, so I can pass the ball, um, as I see it, the Postal Service um, is a government agency which was designed to be self-supporting and funded only by the mailers who use it. But right now, it can keep its lights on, but the long-term financial picture is not good. The magnitude of the unfunded obligations, while not a crisis for tomorrow or the next day, it's got to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. And the longer it's left as it is, the worse the problem is going to get. And what I really hope is that we can collectively on Capitol Hill and more broadly with cross stakeholders come to the recognition that it's the 21st century, it's a digital age, demand has shifted, the way people consume media is different, and we have to right size the Postal Service in order to make it viable. Um, the, the, the longer we put off that conversation, the worse spot we're going to be in and the more extreme choices we'll be left with um, in the future. With that. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Rob? Uh, 
Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me first say um, I agree with everything, so <laughs> <laughs> which is unusual in these kinds of panels. Um, let me also begin by saying uh, how much I respect, endorse, and support the public benefits the Postal Service provides through universal mail delivery today and into the future as it has throughout our history. My concerns don't involve those public functions, but rather how the Postal Service operates in private markets. In particular, I think we need to revise the Postal Service's current business model which economists recognize as a classic instance of monopoly cross-subsidization. It's a big mouthful, but um, I'll try to explain it. That's what happens when an enterprise that dominates one market leverages some of the resources it derives from that dominance into an adjacent market that's competitive, that is, which it doesn't dominate. Um, Everyone or most of you uh, are probably familiar with this phenomenon when private companies do it. The Justice Department slapped Microsoft in the 1990s for first offering discounts to computer makers to preload only Windows in their machines, but second, for additional discounts to consu for consumers to use the office suite of applications designed to operate optimally with Windows. So it had a dominant position in Windows, but not in the applications. And uh, it said, we're going to give you a special discount if you bring them together. Um, now let's apply that model to the Postal Service. It's not a precise parallel, because Congress confers on the Postal Service legal dominance by monopoly covering today the delivery of first-class and standard mail, while Microsoft achieved its dominance of operating systems through innovations, first-mover advantages, network effects, and business practices that ran afoul of the Justice Department. Nevertheless, think of the Postal Service as an organization with two divisions, like Microsoft's operating system division and its office application division where one division has that legal monopoly on first class and standard mail that's supported by certain special subsidies and special rights, and the other division focuses on package and express mail deliveries in competition with private companies, such as FedEx and UPS and others. Like Microsoft in the 1990s, the Postal Service draws on the advantages conferred by its dominance to undercut its rivals and protect its share of the competitive market for package and express mail delivery. Let me say a few things before proceeding further. First, I want to mention that I've advised UPS on these issues for several years, as I have advised the Postal Regulatory Commission on these issues. If Brookings or the IMF had supported this research, as they have done for my research in other areas, the analysis would be the same because the economics doesn't change. Second, let me say I don't blame the Postal Service for these cross subsidies. There's a logic to it that arises from economic incentives. And every country that uh, has started with a postal monopoly and every other, every other nation that subsequently, like us, has opened package deliveries to competition has faced the same issue of cross-subsidies. The difference is that other countries have taken more effective measures to address the issue. Proceeding. Postal Service's public su subsidies make economic sense because its universal mail service operates under legal requirements that raise its costs and dampen its productivity. You need subsidies. It has to maintain underused post offices. It has to charge the same for mail deliveries to hard to reach and easy to reach places. Both measures are tied very closely to the universal service obligation. Congress also mandates that the Postal Service charge mass mailers and others preferential rates, measures not tied to its public responsibility. 
still something Congress decided to do. Based on estimates by the Postal Regulatory Commission, or the PRC, the burdens imposed by Congress raised uh, the Postal Service's cost by about $4.4 billion in 2016. Now, unfortunately, this accounting by the PRC is pretty selective. My own analysis uh, found that the entire set of special Postal Service subsidies and rights were worth about $12.9 billion in 2016. For example, the PRC says that the system's exemption from state and local property and real estate taxes. The Postal Service pays no local or state property or real estate taxes. It's just exempt. And the PRC says that was worth about $428 million in 2016. Well, that's correct arithmetically, but only because the PRC relies on the historical cost of the property and real estate. That is the value, what it costs to buy the land and build the post offices 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. If you, the Inspector General of the Postal Service has estimated the current market value of all those property assets. Um, and if we use that estimate, the tax exemption saved the Postal Service about $2.4 billion in 2016, or they're off by about $2 billion. Here's another example. Postal Service owes federal income tax on the profits from its package delivery division, its commercial division, and it paid $1.4 billion in those taxes in 2016. Get this. It deposits those tax payments in a special postal service fund at the Treasury, from which the Postal Service can withdraw any amount to cover any expense. So in 2016, the Postal Service took back its $1.4 billion tax payment almost immediately, which made it a $1.4 billion subsidy. Now, these are direct subsidies. And Frankly, um, I don't have any problem with the direct subsidies so long as they are required to carry out the universal delivery functions, public functions of the Postal Service. Um, my concern is that, again, as I suggested at the beginning, they leverage these subsidies to provide a preferred position in the competitive market. Uh, this is cross this is what we mean when we talk about cross-subsidization. It happens when the Postal Service uses the subsidies and savings to support not just universal mail delivery, but these competitive operations. Uh, these cross-subsidies received some public attention recently when President Trump denounced the low rates Amazon pays the Postal Service for last mile delivery service. Fact is, every retailer and wholesaler who uses this last mile service pays the same below market rates as Amazon. So the issue is not Amazon, but the rates that are supported by the subsidies. I said that these dynamics have an internal logic that mirrors how businesses behave. Now businesses tend to keep prices high when consumers have few or few alternatives to paying them. Um, so if you know you've got a captive consumer audience, you can keep prices high. And they try to keep prices low when customers can easily go elsewhere. This is a pretty basic piece of economic logic. And that's what happens here. Analysts have found that when the Postal Service raises its prices to deliver packages and, deliver and, packages and express mail by 1%, demand for those deliveries falls by almost seven times as much as it does when it raises the price of delivering first class or standard mail by 1%. That's seven times as much economic response. That's why the Postal Service keeps on raising rates for regular mail and hold down its charges for package deliveries. And it has raised postal rates every year since uh, 2013. Of course, the Postal Service is not just a business with two 
product lines, but a legally created and publicly su subsidized monopoly. Now, according to my analysis, these cross subsidies, which as a technical matter are not allowed by law, were worth about $9.4 billion in 2016. Let's consider two big examples. The same postal workers who deliver first class mail also deliver the packages, usually at the same time, using the same vehicles, air and truck transport, storage and sorting operations, paid for by its subsidized monopoly division. The Postal Service is required to appropriately charge its competitive division for using those resources. And to the extent it doesn't do so, it's providing a cross-subsidy for, for its competitive services. How do we determine those costs? Now, private businesses with multiple divisions manage to attribute all of their costs to one or the other division because the tax law says they have to. Um, if the Postal Service had a process for keeping track of how much time its workers and drivers spend sorting and delivering and so on, and you attributed everything, cost sharing would be a minor issue. We would know how much of those resources the competitive division was consuming and the uh, non-competitive division was consuming. But the Postal Service attributes only about half of its total cost to one or the other division and says that its competitive services account for about 31% of the 50% it can attribute. The other 50% of unattributed costs are said to be shared costs, institutional costs. And in 2016, the Postal Regulatory Commission said the competitive division was responsible for 16.5% of that 50%. They won't, the Postal Service won't let anyone else see the accounting behind that figure, so we don't know how they arrive at it. Given that, I've adopted a standard market-based approach to estimate the competitive division's proper percentage of those shared costs. And it's a lot higher than 16.5%. For example, in most, of, in, most, uh, in most businesses, a division share of a company's total revenues is closely related to its share of common costs. So how much one division takes in a certain amount of revenue, a, a certain share of the revenues, and that's usually fairly closely related to how much of the common costs, for example, for advertising or accounting or legal services that division uh, accounts for. In 2016, package and express mail deliveries generated 26.7% of postal service revenues. That's a long way from 16.5%. Another proxy for the competitive division's use of all those postal service workers and vehicles, facilities, and so on, is the share of cost that it can attribute, uh, which the postal service says is 30.7%. Remember, I said almost 31%. Um, now, the midpoint of 26.7%, 30.7% is 28.7%. Sorry for all the numbers. We're almost done with the numbers. And I think based that using market analysis, um, that's an economically reasonable approximation of the competitive division's actual share of those institutional or share costs. The difference between that and 16.5% becomes a cross-subsidy that's worth about $4.5 billion in 2016. Another big cross-subsidy comes from the special right that the Postal Service has to leave mail and packages in a customer's curbside mailbox or the central mail rooms of office buildings and apartment complexes instead of leaving everything at each customer's door as private delivery firms have to do. This is actually a big deal uh, when you are delivering billions of packages, whether you can leave all the packages for a big apartment building or an office building in the common mail room, or you have to take it to each, each person's uh, um, door. 
Um, this privilege lowered total postal service costs by about $13.6 billion in 2016 compared to the costs if it had to leave everything at each customer's door as private delivery firms uh, do. These savings are perfectly legitimate for universal delivery of first class and standard mail, but they're a cross subsidy when they come from delivering packages and express mail where its rivals can't do so. How big is that cross subsidy? Well, if we said that it's, that the competitive division accounts for 28.7% of postal service operations, uh, the cross subsidy is worth about $3.9 billion. Now, why should you care if you're not a shareholder in FedEx or UPS? To begin, consumers and businesses pay the higher postal rates. And taxpayers ultimately pay for the cross subsidy that artificially undercuts the postal service's rivals for package and express mail delivery. But beyond that, uh, and as an economist, this is what I tend to focus on, the cross subsidies discourage investment and innovation by both private firms and, and the Postal Service. Um, and it's in an area that is a critical part of the expanding internet-based economy. So this is something that, after all, the delivery of online purchases, both for individuals and for companies, is becoming increasingly central to the way this economy operates. And if we have a set of arrangements that discourages investment and innovation in those areas, uh, that's something we should be thinking about. Now, other nations facing, have faced the exact same cross-subsidy issues. Um, when they uh, privatized, uh, often, um, package and express mail delivery. You know, we're in line with every other with most other major countries here. Um, but uh, most other nations have concluded that the best way to address this problem is to spin off package and express mail delivery entirely. That's also, incidentally, what the President's Commission on the Postal Service recommended, I think, in 2007. Then, policymakers could decide how to manage universal first class and standard mail deliveries based on how much the public is willing to pay for them. We might opt for five day residential mail delivery. They might opt to end cut rates for mass mailers. Uh, they might opt to set first class postal rates higher or they might opt to set them lower. Um, and private package and delivery companies including the spinoff from the Postal Service, could all pay the Postal Service the same fees, uh, were, all would have the right to leave their delivery in central mail rooms. Um, that at least would be an economically sound uh, business model for the Postal Service. Thanks. Thank you. And Hello. Uh, so I'm Jim Campbell, and uh, it occurred to me that a reasonable way to start here is to just give you a little bit of uh, explanation as to how I know what I know, and you can appropriately discount what I have to say. Uh, back in the 70s, I worked in the, in the Senate, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in a major economic reform, the deregulation of the airline system. And so my ideas about changing government policy, changing government economic policy sort of stemmed from those days. I met the people that started DHL, which at that time was a very small courier company and a bunch of kids. And uh, I joined them and worked all around the world uh, fighting various uh, interests that resisted the development of couriers, the post offices, the customs brokers, the customs officials, the airlines, and so on. They felt that the couriers were, were, were intruding on their business, but they couldn't do what we could do. And because of this, I was involved in many 
postal policy fights with governments all over the world. And that's essentially how I learned about postal law, uh, all over the world, including the United States. Since then, I've uh, worked with the express companies, FedEx and UPS, <coughs> but I've also worked with the European Commission uh, on a number of studies dealing with the development of postal reform in Europe. I've worked with the uh, President's Commission on Postal Service back in 2003. I've worked with the Postal Regulatory Commission, and I was very much involved in the development of the 2006 PIEA, Postal Accountability and Reform Act. So that's, that's sort of where I'm coming from. Now, thinking about what to say this morning, it occurred to me that rather than trying to formulate the situation in my own words, I could start by reading somebody else's words which run like this. The United States Post Office faces a crisis. Each year, it slips further behind, behind the rest of the economy and service and efficiency and in meeting its responsibilities as an employer. Each year, it operates at a huge financial loss. No one realizes the magnitude of this crisis more than the postal managers and employees. The remedy lies beyond their control. Although the post office is one of the nation's largest businesses, it is not run as a business. And what it does, however, the post office is a business. Its customers purchase its services directly, its employees work in a service industry environment, it is a major communications network. The postal system must be given a management system consistent with its mission if it is to meet its responsibilities as a supplier of a vital service, improve the working conditions and job opportunities of its employees, and end a huge and completely unnecessary drain on the federal budget. Piecemeal changes to the present system will not do the job. A basic change in direction is necessary. That analysis was written 50 years ago by the uh, Capital <laughs> Commission, which was appointed by President Lyndon Johnson after two and a half years of postal crises. Uh, the commission attracted uh, the leading businessmen in the country, and it was led by Frederick Kappel, who was a former chairman of AT&T. The Cap Kappel Commission had a lot of resources, and it worked on its report for 15 months. And it proposed that the post service should be corporatized. That is, it should be turned into a normal corporation owned by the United States but it would have the tools and the, uh, and the incentives of a normal corporation. Congress did not accept the recommendations of the Capital Commission, uh, although they accepted part of them. But the Postal Service was turned into not a, a corporation, but an independent federal agency, which was independent of the president, but not really independent of Congress. So 50 years later, it seems to me, that the mismatch between the uh, legal framework for the Postal Service and the underlying needs of society and the market, the mismatch is substantially greater today than it was back in 1970 or 1968. Uh, the uh, Postal Service, was the, the, the legal framework of the Post Office, the 1970 Act, was essentially created at a time when the Post Office was a medium for the exchange of letters. Today, the volume of letters is down 43% from its peak in 2001. And if you look at the experience of other countries, it looks like the volume of letters is going to go down a lot more. The volume of non-letter documents is down 26% from its peak in 2007. The only thing that's going is the package business. The Postal Service is gradually, and not so gradually, becoming a package delivery system and not letter exchange business. So the issue for the United States, it seems to me, is, as the Capital Commission said, to rethink entirely the legal framework for the Postal Service. Now, this is not exactly a new problem. As Robert pointed out, all the other industrialized nations have had essentially the same problem because they likewise built up great national post offices and they likewise find that the traditional post office is ill-suited to the needs of society now. Of the approximately 24 industrialized countries, 21 of them 
have changed their postal laws fundamentally. And essentially all 21 have adopted the same broad model. That is to corporatize the post office as the Capital Commission recommended and to give it essentially the same commercial freedom as a private company. At the same time, the post office is subject to the same disciplines as a private company, so it loses its legal privileges like, a, like the monopoly. The change in culture at the foreign post office is, is astonishing. They've become commercial, customer friendly, innovative, and interested in diversification. But at the same time, these foreign governments have recognized that the post office provided traditional public services that, that their citizens expected and that needed to be guaranteed. And so in each case, the government has adopted some sort of guarantee of public service, universal service obligation, community service obligation, whatever. And some government entity, the ministry or the regulator, is charged with ensuring that those public services are maintained. The, uh, the government retains the power to order the Postal Service, or in some cases, private companies, to provide these public services, and then compensates the provider of services with the net cost of doing, doing the business. Now, it seems to me that in the United States, the, the, the reality is that there's no plausible alternative to some version of this sort of reform if we want to save the post office and maintain its long-term viability, both for the good of the country and for the good of the employees. The example from abroad, the approach to these other industrialized countries, is really, it sort of shows you the makings of a grand bargain. So in some sense, the Republican emphasis, the traditional Republican emphasis on uh, a more corporate, business-like, commercialized post office is, is right, is acceptable, for the commercial aspects of the Postal Service's business. 94% uh, of the mail is sent by businesses, according to the latest household guide. So most of what the Post Office is doing is in fact selling a service in competition, either directly or indirectly, with other possible suppliers. There aren't very many people that really have to use the Post Office now. On the other hand, the Democrats are right, or the traditional Democratic position is right, in the sense that there are public services that the United States citizens expect to be maintained. And this may be defined as narrowly or as broadly as Congress is willing. But Congress ought to put that on top of the commercially capable post office and then compensate the post office for the cost of doing the business. One last point that, that strikes me in all of this is that I think that the, we have a serious problem in the United States with the lack of governmental resources to really deal with these problems. In 1970, when we established the post office as an independent federal agency, we did not vest any executive department with policy responsibility over the post office and delivery services generally. So unlike other countries, there is no ministry to go to. There's no ministry that, is, that, that is studies these issues and that has a database of facts or the capability of proposing legislation. Right? If you go back to 1970 and you look at rare presidential initiatives in postal policy, they all come from OMB because there's simply nobody else in the government with responsibility. In Congress, uh, we used to have full committees or at least uh, well-staffed subcommittees that dealt with postal issues. And we used to have a, a sort of a deep bench of postal, old postal hands that knew all this stuff for decades. But that, those sorts of resources are, are not available given the fact that the Postal Service has become less and less important to the national, the national uh, welfare. So it, it commands less attention in Congress. That's correct, but it makes it difficult to do something as dramatic and as fundamental as rewriting Title 39. So it seems to me that the only alternative at this point is probably another capital-like commission, but one that draws on not simply businessmen, but also veteran politicians, because this is a political problem <coughs> at least as much as a uh, business problem. Thank you. Okay. And
I want to thank the panel for their remarks, and then we'll move to a few. We have a few more minutes for for Q and A. Um, so you can just raise your hand, and I can call on you. And if if there's any, if you have any questions, otherwise I will pose one myself. I don't know. I don't know which studies you're thinking of. The uh, from what I've seen, privatization. Let me back up here. Most countries have not privatized their corporate jobs. So if the the, the post office is has the uh, flexibility of a private corporation, but it's still owned by government. The um, but there are, there is a movement towards privatization. So the the uh, the Dutch post office is 100% privatized. The German and the British post offices are mostly privatized. Uh, the governments that are doing this are not doing it because they're trying to wreck services for the public. All right? In general, the services, as nearly as I can tell, are much more efficient um, and uh, you know and, ch and cheaper in that sense. But individual individual uh, letters stamp prices have gone up. That's true, and the stamp prices have gone up because the volumes have gone down. The, the postal business is a business of economies of scale. So the more letters you can deliver at one time, the cheaper for each letter. But in, in other countries, uh, the volume of letters is half what it is in the United States per capita. And the, and the volume of letters is declining quickly. So in Denmark, the volume of letters has gone down by something like 90% since 2000. Right? And that's driving up prices. There's just no other way around it. In Denmark, it's true. That's true. In Germany or Netherlands or wherever, it's not true. Uh, yeah, I just, I just want to to toss in that um, about mm, I want to say 15 years ago, uh, a person who was running the postal service as the PMG stepped away from the the job and wrote a post for the Washington a column for the Washington Post, which was quite surprising, where he said that what we should really do with the postal service is give it to the employees make it an ESOP an employee stock to own partnership where the employees have control they own a chunk of the company and that they can work collectively to you know provide the kind of service that they believe needs to be provided in compliance with law because one of the long-standing challenges that the Postal Service has faced is this kind of tensions between the, the top-line managers uh, and the folks who are out there shunting the mail, driving the trucks, and doing all that sort of stuff. There's, you know, every four years, there's four different postal unions every four years. Each of these unions has to sit down and kind of hard bargain with the executives who feel obliged to keep prices down and to try to reduce benefits and this, that, and the other. And of course, the postal workers are like, no, don't balance the budget on our back. Uh, and it's a tension that makes it really kind of hard for the Postal Service to really right-size its operations and make things work uh, as well as they might. Uh, so it's, it's an idea that um, it's been around for a while. Unfortunately, nobody, I think, has introduced legislation that would even consider going down that path. But I keep thinking that there, there might be something there. Also, let's try to think of it this way. The normal way that we reduce costs for a kind of commodity service, the same service that's broadly provided, uh, is we figure out ways to be more efficient, to do the same thing more efficiently. Usually that involves innovating in some way. You introduce new technologies that make workers more productive. The Postal Service has two problems with productivity, um, uh, which BLS <coughs> estimates as has risen about 7 tenths of a percent a year per year for the last 20, 25 years, which is a small fraction of the productivity gains of 
private delivery companies. Now, why is that? Part of it is they've got these public service obligations that are very expensive. They have to deliver mail to uh, people who live in very far-flung places, hard to get to in um, Idaho and in Alaska and in Maryland and Virginia, for that matter. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, the other reason is that if you have a monopoly, you don't have much incentive to invest and innovate because your customers are going to be there anyway. Customers have no alternatives when it comes to first class mail and standard mail. Um, and this is not particular to um, the Postal Service. This is something that afflicts every dominant company. Um, they try to maintain their position keep on doing the same thing uh, they've been doing. And so we have to figure out a way to create those incentives um, if we want the Postal Service to be uh, more efficient and avoid continually annual postal increases. I don't think that this is really a primary problem of postal management. I, mean, I, I suspect, I think from what I understand, that they're trying very hard to make ends meet. I think the problem is really structural. I think that uh, they don't have much commercial flexibility or operational flexibility. Uh, it, there certainly are incentive problems, but the, the, the mere fact that they're not paying, making those payments is for me not really the fundamental problem. The problem is is how the thing is structured, what we expect of the Postal Service, um, and our general failure to compensate them appropriately for loss making services that we're, that we're required to do. Um, I, on the, the young lady's question here, I you know what Robert is saying fundamentally is that if the Postal Service is more efficient, then you're getting more more. Um, Postal service for your money, all right? How they organize the prices for the various services is another matter. And maybe in other countries they are raising the prices on on the individual mailers or stamp prices. Maybe other prices are going down. Efficiency is a good idea. You can't really argue against a more efficient post office, except for you know those who benefit from the inefficiencies. But the the, the real question is, what kind of controls do you then want to put on the post office? To achieve public policy ends, and you know there are ways of doing that, and there are ways of compensating the postal service, and you know we can we can debate about that. But efficiency is good, and fundamentally, what the kinds of things Robert's arguing for should make the postal service, and in other countries has made the postal service more efficient. And I should add on pension. Let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question for after the panel. Uh, because it's complicated. <laughs> but anyway, quick quick point on, pen on pensions. I should add that one one of the big problems is Congress. The rules that, that limit how postal pension money can be invested absolutely and without question hamstring the Postal Service and, and stop it from getting returns that state and local governments get. So at least if Congress can step in with a, with a reform like that, they could alleviate a lot of this problem with minimal 
actual cash outlays, which would be, which would be a big step toward making these problems a lot less contentious. You know, why is it that I and lots of the rest of you here receive about five pounds worth of catalog from Restoration Hardware every year? <laughs> this big stack. Well, one of the reasons is that, by law, that kind of mass mailing gets a very preferential rate. That, on its face, is inefficient for the Postal Service and has nothing to do with universal service. Um, and I expect that if we were charging the actual rate, um, Restoration hardware and others. I don't want to single them out. I just that happens to be the one that I get the most. Um, uh, would would move more to online, and that would be more efficient for everybody. Um, so we need to think about some of these um, old rules that are not set by the post office. They were they were set by Congress um, in just the way that Congress often sets the rules. If I could just jump into uh, two quick points what, in response to what what Ken put out um, about postal service and its incentives. I I get the sense that the postal service has looked at the magnitude of these unfunded obligations and basically said, "There's nothing we can do here, and we don't own that. And if taxpayers have to bail it out, so so be it." The postal service has, and it should be given credit for the fact that it's greatly reduced its cohort of full-time employees. I mean, at one point, I think it peaked somewhere around you know 900,000, and now it's been ground down to about 500,000, and it can't do layoffs. I mean, what it basically does is doesn't replace retirees. You know, it moves positions around, and people say, well, I don't want to move four hours, you know, to get to my job, and so they'll just uh, retire uh, or resign. And so it is, it is ground down the number of employees through the limited tools it has in hopes of right-sizing its network. It's tried to reduce some of its mail sorting facilities and some of its post offices. Uh, it's had limited success with that. Uh, frequently, it faces blowback from Congress and local communities and, and the unions. And you know, the reality is, is that you know, these days, there's about total postal service cost, about what, 80% of the postal service costs are related to compensation. And so one of the hitches that we run into with saying, OK, well, we're just going to encourage people to retire is, well, guess what? You've got them on the pension rolls and you've got them on the retiree health benefit rolls, so you're not like waving bye-bye to costs. And the other point is that the Postal Service has very clearly tried to um, shore up its situation by moving so hard into the parcel business. Now, one of the forgotten pieces of history is that 100 years ago, Postal Service didn't do parcels. It did a small number of things, like it had to deliver live chicks and things like that that were dropped in for, by senators from rural states into the law and forced them to carry certain things like that. But they were not a parcel business. Then during the progressive era, it was argued that there was a market failure out there, that the parcel companies were not well serving the public, and that the Postal Service should get in as a competitor and try to correct the market. Well, they got in in a small way, but the market kind of fixed itself. And Delivery companies popped up like daisies, and we have you know, a remarkable network of those out there. Postal Service remained a bit player. Ten years ago, they were only doing $1.5 billion of a $70 billion you know, Postal Service revenue, $1.5 billion in parcel business. They're now up past $19.5 billion. That's huge. Uh, and that speaks to the fundamental transformation that, that Jim spoke of. Like This is going from a – this without any congressional authorization per se – or kind of collective decision being made, the Postal Service is actually shifting from a paper mail company to a package company, which is, I mean, we all know it's happening, but it's just like the magnitude of how fast it has happened. But it's been a conscious decision. Um, we have time for one more question. Congress. Exactly. So the issue, the policy decision. 
Oh, yeah. Sorry. No. Go ahead. Um, you know, the, the issue, look, the market will provide universal service. It'll price it. The issue here is we have a, as part of the universal service obligation for first class mail, uh, the obligation to deliver that mail everywhere at the same price. Um, that's not what we do with packages. Uh, at, for packages, you want to deliver it to Alaska, it's going to cost you more than if you're delivering it across town. Um, so it's a, um, uh, as I said, it's not an issue of the universal obligation market will provide universal coverage, it's an issue of at what price will it be. If you look at the mm -hmm. case of Amtrak, uh, you know, the notion that you want to provide universal service on every train, and <laughs> you're saying it could result in limitation of access to rural areas, I mean, I understand the cost difference, mm -hmm. but just being able to get it there, I don't know that it necessarily holds that private companies could even define Well, I'm sure that um, there are places in which the price is so high to deliver it that um, no one wants to ship there and no one wants to pay, that no, that no one will absorb that cost. I, I can at least say I've spent a lot of time in tiny little towns in rural New England, rural Vermont. There are little couriers that, that exist in these, little, in these little places that serve Montpelier, Vermont is a tiny little pack parcel carrier. So there, while we don't know whether it will guarantee they will hit every single household, we, the market's shown that they, they'll, they'll pop up in the, even the tiniest of communities to deliver. Um, and I think that's, with that, we are out of time. If you have any more questions for any of us, we are happy to chat. <laughs>